podcast, which is my favorite time to get going. So welcome, I'm going to cancel that um, and hit the right button. There we go. So welcome, everybody. Excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sotner, and I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today's class is all about voting rights in the Constitution and all over the Constitution. So it's a really fun class. And we are super lucky that we have Tom Donnelly. He's one of the top scholars at the National Constitution Center. And he's going to walk us all about this Constitution so we can see where voting is mentioned, can, um, talked about, and part of the United States Constitution, and even talk about some modern court cases that you might be hearing in the news, so you can really get your understanding around voting rights in America, so you can apply them to the cases that you might see coming in the courts in the next few years. So Tom, how excited are you to get started and jump in this fun conversation? Very, very, very excited, Curry. So as always, we start with big giant questions for Tom. We list a million, but if you have questions as Tom goes on, or even now, please feel, to ask, feel free to ask them in the chat or the Q&A. So we always wanna know where in the constitution does it talk about voting rights and what does it say about voting rights? And then how have voting rights changed over time? And why were they set up the way they were set up in the first place? And then we're gonna look at a lot of sections of the constitution to really dive into it. So Tom, as always, we'll start with the where in the constitution do we find voting rights? I feel like we should have some like game show music now. So where in the constitution is voting rights, Tom, take us through all the sections. Absolutely, so thanks so much, Curry. And let's begin with the original constitution. So this is the constitution that was drafted in Philadelphia, 1787. And you can see there on the screen, there are four big parts of the constitution that you wanna flag when you're looking at that original constitution. Three of them are in article one. So article one of the constitution is setting out Congress, the legislative branch of government, it's separating the legislative branch into two different houses, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. And so with Article One, Section 2, we see the Constitution sets out qualifications for voters in U.S. House elections. And Article One, Section 3 talks about elections to the U.S. Senators, how we get U.S. Senators. Under the original Constitution, Senators were actually selected by the state legislatures. We would change that with the 17th Amendment to the Constitution. But there, right there, Article 1, Section 2 tells us the U.S. House elections is going to be the voters selecting members of the U.S. House of Representatives. And under the original Constitution, U.S. Senators selected by members of the state legislature. We see there then Article 1, Section 4 is a part of the Constitution we don't talk about a lot today, but it actually tells us a lot about the original Constitution structure. What it does is it leaves the time, place, and manner of elections to state legislatures, subject, though, to regulation by Congress on the back end. But this is part of why we have such a variety of different voting rules, voting laws, state by state, why we often have to look to state law to determine when we can register to vote and how, whether we can vote by mail and when, whether we can drop our ballots off at drop boxes or not, whether we can vote early or not. We leave so many of these decisions to the states, but also Congress has a role to step in if it wants to, to regulate certain parts of these areas. So that's Article 1, Section 4, striking that balance between the powers of the states and the powers of the national government. And finally, Article 2, Section 1 sets up the Electoral College, which is the selection system that we use to select our president. So there's a lot in there in the original Constitution, Curry. But beyond all of those details, let's emphasize the big takeaway here. So what do we really learn from the original Constitution? It's that the original Constitution leaves voting issues, election issues, largely to the states. It's a story of federalism. It's a story of state power. And as we'll see throughout American history, a lot of what we're debating in the original Constitution, in constitutional amendments added afterwards, and then how we interpret both the original Constitution and those amendments is how much power is left to the states, how much power goes to the national government, how do we strike the right balance within the Constitution's system of federalism. Oh, and I, I love that so much because as you're explaining it, it makes sense why voting isn't something that is like very intuitive, especially for younger students, like going to be the first time voting because it's not the same everywhere. And there's a good reason for that. First of all, to, to ensure that there's balance between the national government and the state government, but also because depending on where people are, states might do it differently and explore and experiment a little bit more. I mean, I know that the Midwest states and the Northern Midwest states were the first to do a lot of modern mail-in voting because their communities wanted it and that's what they were going to move forward with. 
And it started bubbling up as an idea that spread across the United States. But it really kind of grounds us in the Constitution right here. That's why it's like that. That's the power in the Constitution. And this is where the power is being deemed to the states to figure out exactly how they're going to run that election in their state. But the other part that you said really clearly, and there's that next section uh, of that same section four, is it can be regulated by Congress, but it also can be regulated by we the people. And I guess we see that with all the amendments that came pretty quickly after the Constitution was ratified. So I want to walk us through all those amendments that were listed on that right-hand side of that document and talk about how, how do we change the Constitution to ensure, to add more voting rights or to add clarity around voting? And then why did we do it and how, how did we preface it? Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the great things about the original Constitution is that the framers put in there a process for amending the Constitution. It's in Article 5. It tells us that the founders themselves, though brilliant in many ways, didn't think they had all the answers. And they hope that we've learned from our experience and make the Constitution better. And it's a really high bar to amend the Constitution. So the way every amendment that's in the Constitution today, it started by being approved by two thirds of both houses of Congress. That's how we propose a new amendment. And then it has to be ratified, accepted by three fourths of the states. Those states have to say yes to the proposal of Congress. So it's a really high bar, but what's kind of amazing just you see from this graphic here is so many of the times in which we have amended the constitution have had to do with voting and elections. We have 27 amendments to the constitution. We could see eight of them right there having to do with voting and elections. So it's a constant theme of constitutional reform and debate in the United States. And we can just take through, some of these are, are big amendments. Some of them are, 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 are uh, having to do with the details of voting and elections. But you can see we, we've changed way the, 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 the system in ways both big and small. So with the 12th Amendment, it's right there near the very beginning, 1804, shortly after we ratified the Constitution, we're already tinkering with the Electoral College. So we learned some things from those early elections under the original system. And so we tweaked the Electoral College in certain ways. So that's the 12th Amendment. We then fast forward to after the Civil War. And so we have the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. Many scholars refer to these post these, uh, these Reconstruction Amendments, including the 14th and 15th, as America's second founding. And in part, what they're doing is looking back at American history and saying, what sort of rights do we think are absolutely essential to assure equal political rights for African-Americans, equal civil rights for African-Americans. And in part, we get this with the 14th and 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, Section 2, provides a mechanism for punishing states if they deny African-American men access to the ballot box. Later, the Supreme Court in the 20th century would also use the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, its promise of equal protection of the laws for everyone to protect voting rights as well. And then with the 15th Amendment, we have a, a promise to ban racial discrimination in voting. So that's the 14th and 15th, some really big ways in which we changed the Constitution. Flash forwarding ahead then to this next period of constitutional reform, we see with the 17th Amendment, that's 1913, we provide for the popular election of U.S. senators. Again, the original Constitution, U.S. senators are selected by the state legislatures. But with the 17th Amendment, we say, no, 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 no. We think senators should be selected by the voters, and that's the system we have all the way up until today. The 19th Amendment is a huge amendment where we ban sex discrimination in voting. It's another place, Curry, where we can see the value of federalism in our constitutional system, because we saw states, even before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, experiment with, with, with voting for women. It began out west in western states and then spread to the east. And what we, the people, learned is that the women's vote was a good idea. So people were afraid of it. They thought, no, maybe, maybe it won't be good for women. Maybe it won't be good for the nation. But they learned from states experimenting, from states being bold, that women's suffrage worked. 23rd Amendment brings Washington, D.C. voters into presidential elections. It gives Washington, D.C. three electoral votes. And you see, this was, a, this was in 1961, actually, Curry, is the 23rd <laughs> Amendment. And so it's, it's an interesting one because... What, one thing we know about Washington, D.C. is that it has a large African-American population. So this amendment was ratified during the civil rights era, and it was seen as a way of giving this large African-American population in Washington, D.C. a voice in presidential elections. The 24th Amendment is 1964, and it bans poll taxes in national elections. So it's striking at the very heart of Jim Crow laws discriminating against African-Americans at the ballot box. And finally, the 26th Amendment protects the voting rights for those 18 and older. Before the 26th Amendment, most states set the voting age at 21. 
But the 26th Amendment, which is ratified in 1971, grows out of our experience with the Vietnam War. And so we're sending really, really young people over to Vietnam to potentially sacrifice their lives for their country. But in many of their states, they couldn't vote. They were under the age of 21. And so what we're saying is if you're brave enough to fight for our nation, you can certainly vote in our elections. And so this ends up being the fastest amendment ever ratified under four months. So we talk about that demanding process for ratifying amendments. The 26th Amendment ratified in under four months. And that, I mean, it is amazing to think when we talk about Article 5 and it's not easy to change the Constitution, when you have the stars aligned and there's enough momentum on all sides, it's, it's pretty fast. It can move along. But I love that you pointed out that, again, that idea of federalism and how the states can experiment with voting techniques and voting styles. And then an amendment is there, like the 19th Amendment, to say, no, we're going to codify this. We're going to put this value into the Constitution and say it cannot be denied based on sex. Great kind of like balance between the two. So we can see why that there's pros and cons to having all these pieces. Because sometimes you do hear people say like, oh, maybe we should do it a different way. But you see the, the value of it as well. And I love that experimentation in the state. Now, as we dive into these and kind of look closer and closer at these amendments, we're going to, you know, walk through the big ideas around this, but also dive into the founding period. And how did they think about voting? So one of the questions is, who can vote and when? So if we start with the founding generation and we look at, you know, Ben Franklin here, I think that's the Declaration of Independence. It's Adams and Franklin and Jefferson. But who were they thinking would be the people voting it for the House of Representatives and through the Electoral College. I mean, after Washington, of course, is, is no longer a president. Yeah, so I mean, the, again, the founding, founding period is such an exciting moment for the American people. One of the first things we get to do after declaring independence is create new state constitutions. And so with that, we're setting up voting systems state by state and think about how we want American democracy to work. And so there's some variety between the different states, but if we're looking at what's the general rule you would find in most states, is that the states establish property requirements for, for voters. So they're limiting voting rights to those who own property. And so at the founding, that, uh, that usually meant white male landowners. They're the people who have these broadest voting rights, and that's the general rule you would find in most states. But we see even at the founding, some states experimenting. Some, some states moving away from that particular rule. So very, very early in Pennsylvania, in Vermont, you see them getting rid of, rid of property requirements. So untethering voting rights from property requirements. In a place like Vermont, they had also banned the institution of slavery already. And so even right there with the founding generation in Vermont, you can see African-American men who were free able to vote in Vermont's elections. Um, so you see a bit of that. You also see in my home state of New Jersey, that a certain subset of women could vote in elections from 1776 to 1807. These are unmarried women landowners in New Jersey. New Jersey said from 1776 to 1807, they could vote. In 1807, New Jersey decided, no, we're gonna move away from that. And we're gonna, once again, restrict it just to free white males. But it's this brief period of experimentation. So you can see, even at the founding generation, there's a, there's a strong rule in most places where you're limiting voting based on property and it's white male landowners, but you see some variations already at this beginning period and variations that you would see various reform groups pick up over time and say, no, 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 we should move in the direction of the minority of the states, not the majority of them. And um, all the New Jersey people are shouting out right now to their, um, to their home state, uh, look at New Jersey moving forward. But you see kind of this right to vote ebbing and flowing not just where in the country, but like across the country over time. Um, and w one of the first kind of expansions of who gets to vote starts with Andrew Jackson and looking at who's able to vote in his major elections. So can you kind of walk us through this time period and how we start to see this kind of increase of the right to vote for more and more people? Sure. So we're moving into the 1820s, 1830s. This is the age of Jackson. And we're seeing massive changes, as Curry said, to elections and voting. You know, one of the big changes here is that we move towards universal white male suffrage. And so states are moving to abolish property requirements. Poor white men are now able to vote. They weren't able to in many states at the founding, but now in the age of Jackson, they're able to vote. On the flip side, we also still see, we see restrictions for various groups. 
And so this includes women, it includes African Americans. So even if we're just thinking about, what about African Americans? By 1855, so in the eve of the Civil War, only five states permit African Americans to vote. It's Maine, Massachusetts, New England, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. So these are states largely concentrated in New England. Now it's important to note, that's not zero. So you do have a certain number of states that are permitting free African Americans to vote, but it's a small number of states concentrated in New England. What about women? Well, so as we're getting through the age of Jackson into the 1840s, we see the, the, the growth of the women's suffrage movement. So in 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott bring together a group in Seneca Falls, New York. This is the famous Seneca Falls Convention. And for that convention, Stanton ends up writing a, a famous manifesto. It's called the Declaration of Sentiments. And if you read it, it's a fairly short document. I, I urge you to seek it out online. You could read it in virtually no time, but it's so cool because what she does is she rewrites the Declaration of Independence. So she rewrites the Declaration. She asks herself, what would the Declaration look like if it said the sorts of things we think are necessary for equality for women in America? So it opens with these amazing words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And so you see with the Declaration of Sentiment, something that's true of the women's suffrage movement from the beginning all the way up until the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. And that's the suffragists are often drawing on key principles of the American Revolution and the American Constitution to argue that women's suffrage is consistent with America's founding creed and consistent with what's best about America. And so you see that there. You see also in the Declaration of Sentiments where the original Declaration of Independence is complaining about King George III, Stanton and her allies are laying out all of their grievances about how men treat women. And finally, they end with a series of demands, which is really a broad vision of what equality in America should look like according to the Seneca Falls Convention. And the it closes with 12 demands. This includes equal education, equal pay, property rights, and quote, the sacred right to the elective franchise. So that's the early vision that's gonna help animate the women's suffrage movement from then all the way up until we finally get the 19th Amendment. And I'll make sure that we send that document out to everybody because it's so important to see this, not as you know, the women's fight for the vote, the 19th Amendment, the right to vote, but this, this bundle of rights thing. We are, we are people, we are citizens, and we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What does it mean to be an active member of society? And what rights do, are we endowed because of this? And that voting is a part of that list, but not the end all be all. It's a part so you can have voice and agency on who represents you. Now, when we think about this idea of citizenship and the right to vote and how they're so tightly connected, it brings us back to another amazing female leader and I, Harriet um, Scott. And so Harriet Scott and Dred Scott, and how does their fight for freedom, their fight for equality lead to the right of citizenship and the right to vote for African-American uh, uh, people as well? Yeah, and Dred Scott, oh sure. So Dred Scott v. Sanford, it's one of the infamous decisions in Supreme Court history. It's 1857. It's just before, a few years before the Civil War, but it begins with these two people, Harriet and Dred Scott. Husband, wife, they have a daughter. And what happened, they're enslaved people. And so they are at a point in time taken into free territory then brought, brought back into a, a, a slaveholding uh, a territory. And what they argue is by being brought to free soil that they are free. And so they sue for their freedom. There are many of these freedom suits throughout this period of enslaved people trying to argue that no, because of being brought on free soil, they are now free. And so they, this case ends up working its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in a divided decision says, no, Harriet and Dred Scott, you're wrong. And it says a series of things that are really, really uh, uh, you know, troubling to us today and important to keep in mind as we push towards the Civil War into Reconstruction. So the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roger Bertani, says that African-Americans can't be United States citizens. And they had, quote, no rights which the white man was bound to respect. And part of the argument that the court and Tawney are making is an historical argument. And what they're saying is, look throughout American history, African-Americans have never been able to be citizens, they've never been able to vote, and they've always been treated poorly. We all know this. And because of that, we have to draw the conclusion that they can't be citizens uh, of the United States, and they really have no rights which the Constitution is going to protect. Of course, there are two powerful dissents in this case, and it's a reminder that when we're dealing with Supreme Court cases, 
read all of the opinions, read the dissents, because sometimes the dissents have the better argument, even though they lost in their own time. And here we see dissents by Benjamin Curtis and John McLean, and they both, the gist of what they both say is, Chief Justice Taney, you're wrong. Read your history. You get the history wrong. African-Americans not only could be citizens, but they were citizens at the founding. African-Americans not only could vote, but they did vote at the founding and they could still vote in those five states we just talked about, concentrated in New England. You're wrong. Of course, African-Americans can be citizens. In our case, for our story, that means in certain places they can vote. And as a result of that, your history is wrong and your decision in Dred Scott is wrong. Um, and so we want to keep that in mind as we get to this next part of the story. So as we kind of go through and students, as you can see, we're kind of walking you through the timeline and you're seeing people fight for this idea of citizenship, of equality, and utilizing the vote as a part of a mechanism to, again, be representative. So this leads us, this decision kind of blows up into the Civil War and leads us to the end of the Civil War, the Reconstruction time period, which is Tom's specialty is this time period, not that you're not amazingly awesome in every time period, um, but we're going to go through the 13th, 14th, and really focus on the 15th Amendment, since it is, you know, an amazing amendment, and we feel like it could just be a class just on 15. Absolutely. So this is the period after the Civil War. We fought a bloody war, and then we transformed the Constitution forever with these three amendments. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment wrote the promises of freedom and equality into the Constitution. And the 15th Amendment banned racial discrimination in voting. Together, many scholars refer to this as America's second founding. And one way to think about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are all three of them were meant as a response to what, what uh, we, the American people, had learned from the evils of slavery throughout our history. And specifically for the generation that ratified these amendments, it was meant as a way to overturn Dred Scott three different ways by banning slavery, making sure African-Americans can be citizens and saying that they cannot be discriminated against at the ballot box. Let's just drill down a little bit into the 15th Amendment before we move on, Curry. I mean, it emerges within the Republican Party. Republicans, the party of Lincoln control Congress. So they're putting together the first proposals for amendments for the 15th Amendment in late 1868. And they're asking really, really big questions. So they're saying, what kind of constitutional baselines do we need to set to create the America that we think we need after having fought this bloody civil war? What sort of protections need to be in place to make sure there's equal citizenship rights for African-Americans? And so part of what they're saying is with this 15th amendment, do we want an amendment that focuses squarely on racial discrimination or do we want to sweep more broadly than that? Do we want to cover things like discrimination against education, literacy, religion, many other things. And so the Republicans here in Congress, as they're figuring out what sort of amendment to propose, they debate these issues. Congress actually, uh, each House of Congress uh, approves an amendment that's broader than the final one that's ratified. But in the end, the Congress settles on an amendment that focuses squarely on racial discrimination in voting. You could see why this would be the paradigm evil that they're trying to combat is this history of treating African-Americans poorly, discriminated against them, enslaving them. And now they're trying to make them full and equal political citizens in America. And so, you know, on the, in the end, it is, a, it is an amendment that is unbelievably transformational. It was absolutely inconceivable to most Americans and most political elites before the Civil War. Now, of course, this didn't grow out of, it didn't come out of nowhere. Like what have African-Americans been demanding for decades upon decades? They're meeting in conventions, discussing what they think equal citizenship has to mean. And they're saying year upon year, decade upon decade, give us the vote. Of course, get rid of slavery before the Civil War, but also grant us the vote, give us full political participation, and we can help, it can help us take care of ourselves. We don't need protection. We can protect ourselves with the vote. And so with the 15th Amendment, we promise to ban racial discrimination voting. We write it into the Constitution. It's ratified in 1870. You can see this amazing quote from Frederick Douglass to give really the power of this moment. The 15th Amendment's ratified and what Frederick Douglass says is the revolution wrought in our condition by the 15th Amendment is almost startling even to me. I view it with something like amazement. What powerful words. And, I, and again, what I, I love this idea of people calling for their their equal due and their rights. And we see even before the 15th Amendment, this the experiment of interracial democracy working and being successful and seeing I mean, the percentage is unbelievably high. It's like 90% of registered African-American male voters are voting. It's unbelievably crazy high. 
And we're seeing this amazing vote and we're seeing not just African-American men voting, but also serving in office, in political office. So Tom, tell us a little bit about this amazing moment in time. Yeah, and it's true, it's for a time, you know, it's a far too brief a time, but the, this vision of reconstruction, this vision of multiracial democracy really worked in America. And so Curry's right, we have massive participation in elections by African-Americans, and that's for members of Congress, members of state and local governments, but it's also for the votes that eventually led to the ratification of the 14th and 15th Amendments. And the thing that's important to remember is Congress passes laws that grant African-American men access to the ballot box even before the 14th and 15th Amendments. So their votes play a key role in ensuring that those very amendments get ratified. But during this period, especially into the 1870s, we see African-Americans serving at all levels of government in the U.S. Senate and U.S. House, as governors, as state legislators, all the way down to sheriffs and justices of the peace. We see mass of just a massive explosion of multiracial democracy, but again, it's for far, far too brief a period. Shortly thereafter, we see white Southerners regain control of their governments. And then through a combination of extra legal violence, but also laws, laws passed by state legislatures, state constitutional amendments, we see them put in place a legal framework known as Jim Crow, which ends up denying African-Americans the promise of the 15th Amendment and denies them access to the ballot box using things like poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, all of these various legal mechanisms to deny what was so obviously the purpose of the 15th Amendment, which was to ensure political equality for African-Americans. Okay, awesome, Tom. I got two things for you. So we're gonna jump from suppressing the vote in, this is 1870 is the 15th Amendment. What happens after that, within the decades after it, we're gonna jump to 1965 and look at the Voting Rights Act of 1965 but one little detour, which is really, really important. We're, I wanna talk about Native Americans and the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 and weave the story of Native Americans into this piece. Warren had asked about it and it's a great question. Where, at what point in time do Native Americans get the respect of citizenship and of the vote? Yeah, so the, the Native Americans get citizenship with the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. And so here, why 1924? So the reason why, it's a lot like a lot of these other amendments. Native Americans were serving in the military in World War I. And so it's another example where once a certain group is out there defending the country, uh, giving, you know, willing to sacrifice their lives, it, often citizenship rights and voting rights come along with it. We saw it with the 15th Amendment with African Americans, with African American soldiers fighting in the Civil War. And we saw it with the 26th Amendment, with young people going off to Vietnam and then eventually being given the right to vote if they're 18 or older. And we see the same thing here with the Act of 1924. So that grants Native Americans full citizenship. And then there are still certain states that have certain uh, forms of discrimination against Native Americans in voting. And those also fall by the wayside. Eventually the last one of those laws, I believe is 1957 in Utah. And so again, it's often with a lot of groups, it was true of African-Americans and women, there is sort of first comes full citizenship and then eventually will come the right to vote. Great, okay, so now kind of jumping from 1880s and the suppression of the vote through laws and through violent acts. And uh, you pointed that out and it's, it's, a, it's a systematic use of oppression to stop the African-American vote. And we do not see major change of this happening until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that brings in Fred's question to say, to talk about not just the 1965 Voting Rights Act, but Shelby v. Holder and the outcome of that case. So I, I said there was only two things, but I just added another one on to you. So could you walk us through that real quick? Give us that foundation on what the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was and what it did and how Shelby v. Holder affected it. Absolutely. So, I mean, what we see coming into the 20th century is the Supreme Court begins to take on more voting and elections cases. You know, part of that is through the 15th Amendment. Part of it is the Supreme Court recognizing the fundamental right to vote as a right that's protected under the 14th Amendment. And so you see with that, the Supreme Court becoming more active in cases like uh, Baker v. Carr and Reynolds v. Sims, which gives us one person, one vote, which tells us legislative districts have to be roughly the same size. And so you see them taking on certain issues like that. Really, in a lot of ways, the big, big, big inflection point for voting rights, both in Congress and at the Supreme Court during this period, is with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 
And so this is the act that really puts teeth into the 15th Amendment. It arises out of the civil rights movement. In, the way, in a way, it's one of the lasting achievements, crowning achievements of the civil rights movement itself. And it is the way in which Congress decides to take on Jim Crow laws in voting head on. And so the really big feature of this act is what's called preclearance. And so that's just a fancy way of saying that, you know, we're going to look at all of the states, we're going to look at their record on voting rights, we're going to look at their record on whether they've been discriminated against African Americans. And if they have a bad record on voting rights, what we're going to do is they, they used to have this massive power to shape voting and elections. Well, we're going to say, no, 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 in areas that are touching on race, if you have a bad record on voting rights, if you want to change your voting laws, you have to get the national government's approval first. You can't change your voting laws. You can't change your election laws without the national government's approval. This is a massive shift from the original constitution and original vision of what we talked about. But what Congress is saying is the 15th Amendment and the 14th Amendment give us broad powers to protect the rights, especially of African-Americans. We're going to exercise them here to ensure the tr that the promise of the 15th Amendment is actually enforced. This is the method that we think is absolutely essential. And so they passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and it works. It really works. We see the death of these Jim Crow laws, and we see a massive expansion of voting by African-Americans. But of course, there's very quickly a legal challenge. South Carolina comes to the court right after the Voting Rights Act is passed and says, no, 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 Congress has the Constitution wrong. The Constitution says we, the states, have massive power, and that Congress, at the very least, has to treat us, the states, the same way. It can't single out South Carolina and treat us less poorly and take away our traditional powers. And so South Carolina comes to the Supreme Court, and in a case called South Carolina versus Kotzen back in 1966, Chief Justice Earl Warren says, no, South Carolina, you're wrong. Congress, you're right. And it upholds the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It upholds the preclearance requirement. And it says it, a very simple thing. It says the 14th and 15th Amendments give Congress massive power to enforce the protections therein. One of the core protections is to end racial discrimination in voting. Jim Crow laws for decades upon decades have denied African-Americans access to the ballot box. All Congress is trying to do here is to try to set the Constitution right and ensure racial equality in voting. Of course, that's constitutional. It's strong medicine. But because of Jim Crow, we need strong constitutional medicine to get rid of it. So that's South Carolina versus Katzenbach. Now to bring us into the, the, you know, the 21st century and a more recent case, it's 2013. The case is Shelby County versus Holder. And the Supreme Court's returning to questions about the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act, except now 50 years, roughly 50 years after it passed. And so we have states coming in and saying, you know, we understand what the court said in South Carolina versus Katzenbach. We've read the Constitution, but if you look at the Voting Rights Act, it's still true. It, 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 the preclearance requirement is still there, but Congress has never updated the formula to tell us which states are acting poorly and which ones are acting okay. They're using an old formula from data from the 1970s. They never updated it. So you have certain states and localities coming in and saying, we've improved our voting rights record, but Congress is still requiring us to clear our laws with them. That's unconstitutional. That denies you know, the powers that we have as states. It's inconsistent with the Constitution system of federalism. And the Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, sides with the challengers. And so what it says, it says, you know, challengers, you're right. Congress has reauthorized the Voting Rights Act, but it hasn't updated the formula. And if the preclearance, you know, the Voting Rights Act is still constitutional. The preclearance requirement, though strong constitutional medicine, is still constitutional. But if Congress wants to use that, it has to update the formula. Until then, it can't use preclearance. And so that's the majority. Then there's a powerful dissent by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where, again, it's a five to four decision. It's a really close one. And what she says is, you know, majority, you have it wrong. You have it wrong. The Constitution grants Congress broad powers in this area. The Supreme Court in South Carolina versus Katzenbach, you know, 50 years ago, said that this, you know, the Voting Rights Act is consistent with the Constitution. The Voting Rights Act has worked. Jim Crow is dead, and African Americans have broad voting participation thanks to the Voting Rights Act. And in the end, Congress has reauthorized this act many different times, including in 2006. They've used, you know, extensive hearings, and it's passed with bipartisan majorities of Congress and. It's been signed by presidents from both parties. And so majority wrong. And here's the, the famous quote from Justice Ginsburg's dissent is throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. And so this is again, a reminder that I think Shelby County Beholder really gives you 
a good framework for understanding how so many debates over voting rights and elections happen inside the courts and in constitutional politics. And it often is going to pit arguments that on the one hand, like Chief Justice Roberts's majority opinion in Shelby County, really value federalism and the traditional powers of the states and are somewhat skeptical of the use of national power to really um, uh, restrict the traditional powers the states have over elections and voting. And on the flip side, you see with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a broad reading of the powers that Congress has in this area. So, you know, as with many things, you know, the, what we really want to be able to do is to provide you with a framework for understanding these debates as they're in the news, as they're happening before the Supreme Court. And so hopefully by giving you a, a firm grounding in the Constitution's text, its history, and then the various sides of the debates you find in cases like Shelby County Beholder, you can read the opinions, the Constitution, the histories yourself, and make your own decision about how you, you know, which, which laws you think square with the Constitution and which do not. Awesome, Tom. That was really helpful. And like with, with strong assignment to pay attention to how these laws and these acts and these court cases are coming out. Now, we just wanted to circle around um, the preclearance one more time. And Colin was in the same wavelength my brain was. So Robert's court, it's a 5-4 decision, number one, so it's pretty close. But the Robert, Robert says, okay, back to you, Congress. So I guess then the question is, what is the likelihood of Congress actually resetting that baseline data and saying, we're gonna go in and we are gonna reset the preclearance. We're gonna look at the new data and, and then move it forward. Because you're right, I think the, it's like Bush 43 who signs it the last time. It has a powerful speech about the Voting Rights Act when he signs that into um, law again and moves it forward. So just to think of like the modern context, is there anything around Shelby V. Holder that could be mitigated, changed or added to or modified by the way the court read that case? Well, I think it, 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 Chief Justice Roberts is very overt in the opinion itself, where he says, you know, we have, it, we, there were other cases before Shelby County where the court had warned Congress there might be some constitutional problems here. You might want to fix things like the formula. And Roberts is saying, you know, right now what we're doing is we're saying, as this currently exists, you can't use preclearance. The ball is now in your court Congress. And, you know, you know some people might argue that you know, anyway, I, I'm not here to politically prognosticate, but I mean, it, it, it's not only like, was that maybe something that was in the mind of the court, but it was so consciously something that Chief Justice Roberts said was that it certainly can be back in Congress's court. We said it, we you sort of, they said it, it, you know, before Shelby County, and then Roberts said it again there. Yeah, and I think your counterpoint, what you were going to say is what Colin said in the chat, um, is it possible? Um, so it's great conversation, great question, but again, going back to look at voting rights as I, I love this topic because it makes you stand on the balcony and look at how our country sees voting rights in America and look over a course of time and understand um, the balance that we struck with federalism and through the amendment process. And then look today and say, how do the, the understanding of what we've learned from the history and the constitution apply for what I believe it should be the right constitutional question at hand. So Tom, thank you so much. What a great class. Students, we're gonna wrap up now, but we'll stay if you have any follow-up questions and we'll be here. Awesome class, Tom, thank you. All right, thank you everyone.